just um, brace yourself for this one. <clears throat> the angel Gabriel said it to the priest Zechariah as he announced the imminent pregnancy of his barren postmenopausal wife. Gabriel said it again to Mary while delivering the news that she would carry in her own body, the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God. It was also told to Joseph in a dream, directing him to still take Mary as his wife, even though she was pregnant with a child that was not his own. And later the angel proclaimed it to the lowly shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And after their son's birth, later, and a later strange visit from Magi from the east, Joseph is warned in a dream by a heavenly messenger to take his young family and flee to Egypt and escape from the pending slaughter of the innocents by a hysterical king. Over and over and over again, we hear that message. Do not be afraid. Why? Well, okay, for starters, and let's get this out of the way, it's very likely because the appearance of angels is a fear-inspiring thing. They are, after all, beings from another realm that probably don't look much like the cute chubby cherubs or the statuesque beings with giant albatross-like wings depicted in Renaissance art. According to various accounts across the scriptures, oh, angels do have wings. In fact, they're covered in them. And they're also covered in eyeballs. And some have multiple faces around their heads. Others look like a strange shimmering Mobius strip or a wheel. Sometimes they look like they're on fire. So do not be afraid, indeed. And so their appearance is likely part of the answer, part of the reason why they start with, do not be afraid. Angelic messengers have to reassure those to whom they appear because their presence scares the daylights out of mere mortals like us. But I wonder if there's another reason. Just hear me out. What if a reason that angels so often offer those words of reassurance, do not be afraid, is this. Angels show up most often to people who are already afraid. What if fear itself acts as a magnet for God? What if fear serves as an SOS beacon an emergency transponder? What if trembling hearts are as irresistible to God as the cry of a hungry infant is to her mother? What if God's mercy lets down involuntarily, like mother's milk, at the sound of plaintive, frightened souls? It's a working theory. Just stay with me. We can agree that there is no other story in all of scripture so littered with angel sightings as the events surrounding the conception, birth, and infancy of Jesus the Christ. And perhaps it just needed to be this way. The whole story of the incarnation of God taking on flesh and bone is so scandalous that left up to human management, Jesus might not have even made it to his due date, let alone his second birthday. Try to imagine this story without divine intervention. I tell you for certain, it would have had a much quicker ending. Fear and confusion would have ended all of our characters much sooner than anticipated. Angels aren't decoration. They are necessary stage managers. I have said it before, but it bears repeating. We have sanitized and normalized and made a silent night of the nativity story. We have buffed out all the rough edges. We have taken a feast and stuffed it into a blender so that it goes down easy, like a smoothie or baby food. We don't even notice that someone snuck kale in there. 
I once preached that the nativity story doesn't phase us because we are desensitized to scandal. And that might be truer now than it was four years ago. <clears throat> but I actually think we have done this one to ourselves. We boil it down, we romanticize it so that the story of a pregnant unwed teenager and a retiree preparing for her own labor and delivery, and an unhinged, self-absorbed, and ignorant political leader on a killing spree seems quaint and a necessary part of our Christmas pe preparations. But it's not quaint. The circumstances surrounding the nativity are terrifying. In first century Palestine, it was asking for trouble, even death, to stand out to do things differently, to upset the norm. So a postmenopausal woman becoming pregnant, a virgin conceiving a child, a king catching wind that a newborn usurper was among the riffraff of the town is not good news. It's cause for panic and fear. The first two chapters of each of Matthew and Luke's Gospels are rife with scandal, with fear and anxiety, violence and mistrust of a miracle. And so enter an angelic messenger. Do not be afraid. But back it up. Because while the circumstances of Jesus' conception, gestation, delivery, and infancy were rife with reasons to be fearful, I think that all of those characters were already experiencing a certain level of dread in their lives. Herod was mentally unstable, a tyrannical king who had already murdered members of his own household out of fear and jealousy. And the Jewish people were already under Rome's oppressive thumb. The bodies of convicted criminals and accused rebels hung from crosses, lining the highways into major cities. A visual warning for anyone thinking about stepping out of line. Theirs was a hand-to-mouth existence. You were born, you grew up learning skills to keep yourself and your family alive. You hoped you'd marry and bring children into the world so that when you're old, you'll be cared for until you die. The end. Head down, shoulder to the wheel, that was it. Should one part of that equation go wrong, it could mean death. There was already so much fear and anxiety in the lives of each of these characters, so much violence and misogyny and injustice, that when an angel appears with the pronouncement, do not be afraid, I'm pretty sure the message was not considered unfounded. There was a lot of fear in those days, and the gospel writers go out of their way to make sure their readers know that by painting the political and economic climate for their birth narratives. Here are the angels bringing messages of good news into a story that otherwise would be characterized as a tragedy, a dystopian, or even a horror story. So what does this tell us about God? Well, it has led me to wonder if fear itself acts as a magnet for God. It has caused me to wonder, what if trembling hearts are as irresistible to God as the cry of a hungry infant is to its mother? What if God's mercy lets down involuntarily, like mother's milk, at the sound of plaintive, frightened souls? Do not be afraid, darling. God is with you. That's essentially what follows in scripture, isn't it? To Zechariah, do not be afraid, your prayer has been answered. To Mary, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. To Joseph, do not be afraid to take her as your wife. The child she bears has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And to the shepherds, do not be afraid, a savior has been born to you. Do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, God is with you. Look. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him God is with us. Emmanuel. 
My working theory leading into this sermon is that our fear and anxiety might just draw God to us the way a crying newborn draws the attention of their newborn, the way a mother's milk lets down involuntarily. Heavenly messengers are infusing tidings of good news into a story that otherwise would be characterized as terrifying. It reminds me of that story which appears in all three of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew 9, Mark 5, Luke 8, check it out, of the woman with the 12-year hemorrhage. How in her fear and in her desperation, she reached out and just touched the hem of Jesus' cloak and immediately the power went out of him to heal her. It let down, like mother's milk, to a hungry infant. Without effort, life and healing flow from God where there is fear and hunger and pain and injustice and loneliness. Do not be afraid. Emmanuel. Well, if there's any year that has run the gamut of inducing fear, <clears throat> this has been it, at least in most of our lifetime. What started as wildfires ravaging Australia, do you remember that in January, has taken one bad turn after another. Tyrannical, crooked leaders and politicians, polarized politics and the rise of extremism on both sides. Genocide, the breakdown of public trust in those who were believed to function to serve and protect, triggering protests and standoffs and even riots a global pandemic that has already claimed over 1.6 million lives globally, and that number just continues to climb, not to mention the ripple effects of deaths it has caused as a result of psychological distress and socioeconomic disparities. Dreams dashed, families torn apart, even with a vaccine on the horizon, the impact of 2020 will be felt for years to come. Merry Christmas. So, with all of our collective fear and anxiety, here's my question. Where is our angel? Hmm? Where is the heavenly host that will come down and speak to our terrified world? We need some otherworldly body to come down and call us out of our fear. I don't care how many wings or eyeballs it has. Just somebody, please. Anybody. People we love are sick and we are afraid. The world is on fire and industries are dying and we fear for the future. The ice caps are melting and earthquakes are happening in places that really shouldn't feel so shaky. And natural disasters grow in frequency and intensity and we are fearful. We wonder what will fall apart next. What thing that used to make sense will suddenly be rearranged tomorrow. And it is so tempting to let our minds wander to cynicism. Maybe God has decided we aren't worth the trouble after all. I wonder if, like everything else this year, the baby in the manger has been canceled. Maybe we are all standing here just holding our silly candles, watching a darkening, empty sky, wondering, where is our angel to reassure us? To reassure the man whose wife is dying a slow, painful death of cancer, and he doesn't know if he's more afraid of the illness or the dying or the living that comes after. To reassure the woman whose child is fighting a losing battle with substance abuse and she's terrified every night when she goes to sleep that she will be awakened by a telephone call from the police or the hospital or the morgue. To reassure the young person who went to school and worked hard and graduated but can't find a job that pays enough to afford rent and food and heat and student loans. To reassure the Muslim whose faith community received a horrible threatening letter in the mail a couple of weeks ago and now the headscarf that used to feel safe and comfortable feels instead like a bullseye. To, reaff to reassure the transgender teenager whose parents just kicked them out 
or the young black man growing up in a world that tells him his life doesn't matter, or the older woman whose children have moved away, whose friends have died, and who feels like the world has just left her behind. Where is the angel sent to reassure them, to reassure you, to reassure me? Well, friends, the great and terrible news is this. We might be it. You and I. The greatest hope for the delivery of that desperate and fragile message right now might rest in us. Or as author and speaker Glennon Doyle wrote in December of 2016, yet still as true today, when you read about the atrocities and see the pictures, it feels impossible. You feel paralyzed. There are no words. I watch the reports and I think, wait, where are the world leaders? Where are the grown-ups? Aren't there rules about life and death and good and evil we're all supposed to be trying to follow? But I have learned there is no Oz behind the curtain and it's scary. But that's when we remember that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. We stop waiting and start moving. We move from pity and fear to compassion. And friends, she's right. It's a scary moment when we recognize that maybe no politician or world leader is going to show up and fix things. And maybe no angel is going to come down in a blaze of light and speak a perfect word of peace. But in that realization, there is a measure of empowerment, an urgency to become the messengers. Do not be afraid. God is with us. Emmanuel. And when we speak this powerful truth into the void, we discover that angels are not the dazzling, glittery stuff of Renaissance paintings after all, but our own impulse to move as ambassadors of God's presence. We proclaim peace by giving money to causes that work for justice and also to a stranger who is hungry for food. And we activate grace through prayer and by showing up and sometimes simply by choosing not to look away, not to numb out or distract ourselves to it all, to have the courage to look directly at the pain and grief and fear of the world and with shaking voices whisper into the darkness, do not be afraid. God is with us. We have not been abandoned. Like a crying newborn, our fear calls God to us. Sure, we could spend this season waiting for the fiery sky show and choral concert that shook the shepherds in Luke 2. But the truth is, we might be it. There's a pretty good chance that we are the voices God has called to beckon each other out of fear and into active compassion, to demand justice and to share grace generously. 2020 has been a bit of a show, hasn't it? So what if instead of sanitizing and, and romanticizing the nativity stories, we let the mystery of Mary and Joseph's courage in an impossible moment remind us that Jesus does not come to a world where all is well, Jesus comes to a violent, scary, sick, and broken world. And he is not born to those who are perfect and whole. He is born to the poor and the weary and the brokenhearted. He is the light in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And so with trembling hands, hold your candle. With shaking voice, proclaim the good news to a world enwrapped in fear. Do not be afraid, dear ones. God is with us, and we are with each other. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.
in our pain, our blue, our beautiful, our hard, our messy, our ugly, our struggles, and our joys. God is with us. God accompanying us. God alongside us. God amid us. God among us. God beside us. God by us. God including us. God near us. God plus us. God upon us. God as companion to us. Side by side us, God in the thick of us, in the thick of our humanity, in the middle of this weary world, God is with us, in the gift and in the muck and mire of real life, we are called to be present, to be in the flesh with one another accompanying others, alongside others, amid others, beside others, by others, for others, including others, near others, a companion to others, side by side with others, in the thick the world in the thick of the beautiful, 